Okay, let's get going. Uh, we have on tap today uh, a new topic, something that you probably haven't seen in any of your uh, classes up to now in your engineering curriculum. We're going to talk about stress, okay, and particularly stress with respect to materials, all right? And uh, by way of introduction to this topic, let's talk about uh, kind of deep down inside of a material, what is it that composes materials, all right? And we could answer that question in a lot more detail than I'm going to today. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you a little bit, a kind of a little model of thinking about what's inside of a material that actually really isn't correct at all, um, but it works for the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, so I just want you to realize that there are more complicated ways of, for us to model the particles that compose materials, right? But it's not wrong to think of materials as being composed of particles. And so that's what I'm, I'm trying to maybe motivate right here at the beginning. So uh, what we're going to do here is think of this as being a particle that could compose some material, and then think of the particle as having a certain number of bonds that it is capable of making with its surrounding pieces of material, okay? And uh, with one piece of material, one tiny little particle like this, I mean, A, that never really happens, but B, it doesn't, you know, do us much good to think about, you know, how much force it could take before that little particle itself broke, all right? So let's think about the, uh, the next size up for us to think of uh, a piece of material. And let's think of it as being two particles. Okay, so here's a particle, and there's a particle. And we can think of there being all these bonds available. So this bond happens between this particle and this particle. We could show all the other ones too if we wanted, right? We could show other bonds happening here, or potentially could happen, all right? And let's think about uh, applying a force to these bonds. And the force that I'm gonna think about applying to, I guess, this one bond right? Let's say that I apply to it exactly the amount of force that it takes to break that bond, all right? And let me just call that value F. So that's how much force it takes to break this bond. And this is kind of your smallest piece of material that has more than one particle that you can imagine, okay? Good so far? All right. So now my next question is, if that is basically what we're kind of talking about there, that's the strength of one bond, right? It can carry that much force, F, and that's the strength of that one bond. What if I uh, add another bond into the chain, okay? So let's say I, uh, instead of just having two bonds like that, now I have three bonds, okay? So I have this, this, and this. And now I'm, I'm talking about there being a bond here and a bond here. You know, I could show the others as well, but let me just show those because those are the ones that matter to me in terms of how this thing connects with its other material, okay? How much force should this be able to take? Okay, someone says it should take the same amount before it breaks. Why? Okay. Well, we would imagine that if this is the same kind of material with the same kind of bonds, we wouldn't have any reason to think that one of those bonds would be any different than the other bond. And in order to break this piece of material, uh, it only takes breaking one of the bonds in order for the material to come apart, right? If either one of the bonds breaks, the material will come apart and it will break, okay? Good so far? So what we can actually surmise from this is that in terms of how much force a body can take before it breaks, we shouldn't primarily be looking at the length of the, the body along the direction that the force is being applied, right? Because all you're doing is you're stacking up more bonds that are more or less the same, and it doesn't make it any more or less likely to break by you know, stacking that length up, okay? So, so far, so good. We found something that isn't uh, a factor or shouldn't really be thought of as a factor with respect to how much force uh, a piece of material can can take okay well so let's do one that's a little bit different instead of stacking up that way why don't I show another piece of material that this one 
let me actually put together um, a number of these particles, okay? So there we've got um, a few of the particles, and these particles are going to have these bonds that ex exist in between them, okay? Like this, okay? Now, that's a little bit hard to draw because there's also one behind uh, this piece, and so I could draw in those bonds as well, okay? My point with this is if we load this and then figure out a way to apply a force across the entire face, in other words, you know, you kind of imagine um, t being able to apply a force just over this entire face over here and then another one over here, okay? So, and so think of implying something like this across that entire face. All right, same kind of material as I had before. How much force do you feel like I should be able to apply in this case? If, you know, if I could apply F to my first case up there, how much can I apply to this new case? Okay, I agree. Someone says it should be around 4F. Why? Okay. You can view it two different ways. You know, I think to me the, the way that makes the most sense is to view it as you're taking the overall force and dividing it by four because you're splitting it between the four bonds. So however much force you apply uh, externally, each bond is going to carry a quarter of what you apply externally. So therefore, if any one of the bonds takes F to break, then it should take 4F to break the whole thing, okay? Now, I could keep going with this. Uh, what if I did one where instead of it being just 4 like this, what if I did it to where, um, you know, we had a, a piece of material, say, that was too wide, like this, and uh, let's say it was a couple high, you know, or just one high like this. We'll just do it like this, okay? And so then it's bonded with uh, another set over here, you know, this gets a little bit tricky to draw, but, you know, something along these lines. So there's these bonds. It goes something like this. Okay, another particle here, another particle here. My question with this is if we do the same thing again and we apply a force uh, across here to all of that face and a force across here to all of this face this way, how much force should it be able to take before it breaks that piece of material? Six F. Okay. And you're doing the same thing. You're basically counting up the number of bonds. All right. This is all fine and good when we're thinking about this microscopic level and think, you know, imagining to ourselves that maybe we could see all these little bonds and count them all up and figure out how many of them would break. You know, that's, that's all nice and fun to think about, but that's not how we actually experience materials, right? Because the materials we experience have millions and millions, probably billions of these little bonds that hold it together. You know, add to that another factor, and that is that, um, you, uh, you don't actually have in a real material all these nice straight bonds that are exactly the direction that you're pulling uh, on the material with, right? So it's actually more complicated than what I'm saying here. But there's a principle that happens here that actually holds regardless of those discrepancies between what we're doing here and what the real world has. And it's this. As we increase the number of bonds here, um, what we're doing also is increasing the amount of what we call cross-sectional area of those pieces of material, okay? What do you think we mean by cross-sectional area? If you were to cut it in half what the area of the surface would be. Okay, yeah, you imagine like essentially cutting through this thing with a plane, you know, and you're basically cutting right through this thing. You're saying how much area would I cut through with a plane that's perpendicular to the direction that the, of the force that I'm applying, right? And that cross-sectional area, uh, if you increase that cross-sectional area, you should be able to increase the amount of force that it takes before it breaks the material. 
okay? And this is what gives rise to what we consider to be sort of the definition of stress at the macroscopic level, which is that next uh, segment that I have right here, okay? So at a macroscopic level, if we're applying a force of F to a piece of material, right, then we define a certain amount of stress, which the, the symbol that we use for that, okay, I'll say stress here, okay, and actually I'm going to put something else here, normal stress. We'll talk about the other type here in just a second, but normal stress, we give this the uh, symbol of lowercase Greek sigma, and the way we handle this is by taking force divided by area, and when we think about the area, what we do is we think about cutting through the piece of material with a plane that's perpendicular to the direction of the applied force. Okay, that's actually part of why we call this normal stress, because the word normal carries with this, this idea of being perpendicular. So this is a stress uh, on a plane that is perpendicular to the direction of the applied force. Okay. All right, so let me put a heading on this that says this is for normal stress. Okay, now let me contrast that with another type of stress that is called shearing stress. Okay. And the easiest way for me to describe shearing stress is to show a, uh, a force being applied to this little piece of material here, and this time defining a plane that instead of being perpendicular to the direction of the applied force, now this plane is parallel with the direction of the applied force, right? And you can imagine there that uh, if you pulled hard enough on that top surface, and then the little hash marks down here indicate that the bottom is fixed, if you could pull hard enough at some point, you may be able to cause essentially a fracture along this plane, okay? And if that occurs, you know, then that's an, another type of failure we need to think about, but it's caused by a shearing stress as opposed to a normal stress, all right? So down here, let me call this shearing stress. We usually use a different letter when we're talking about shearing stress. We use a lowercase Greek tau, okay? But the definition of it is still the same. If this is F, then we define this as being F over A. Okay. The only difference being that the A that we're talking about here is perpendicular to the direction of the applied force. whereas the A here is parallel. Okay. All right, so you get this idea. Um, the other thing that I'll mention here before I move on, these also deform in different ways. Right? So if the, in the normal st stress kind of a situation, um, the way you're going to see that deform is essentially it's going to get longer. Right? If it was going to stretch a little bit before it broke, this would stretch out a little bit longer. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the topic of uh, deformation of this thing. How does the shearing stress element tend to deform before it breaks? Okay. Yeah, it, it kind of skews a little bit. So you might think of this thing as uh, taking on more of a parallelogram shape, something like this, right? Under that applied force of F. Okay. But either way, we're talking about the definition of stress being uh, force over area. You just got to make sure you understand where the plane is that you are defining as the, the plane upon which stress is acting. Um, all right, and, and 
just so we don't miss the big idea here, if stress gets up to a certain level or higher, we expect a material to break, right? If it stays below a certain level, then we expect the material not to break. And that's why we care about defining this term of stress. All right, so let's actually look at this. We're gonna do, you know, a kind of an, almost an example problem in that I'm not going to give you um, like specific numbers, but let's say this is a, um, a tongue pin and clevis system. Sometimes you call this a clevis and pin uh, connection, okay? So let's say that for this connection, we happen to know all of the dimensions, like any of the dimensions we want, we can have it, okay? I didn't label them all up here because that's part of what I want you to think through with me as we talk about uh, the ways that a part like this could fail, right? When I say fail, I mean if I apply a load to it, right? A load is another word for a force. So if I apply a force like this on this thing, okay, so I'll just call that F. If I keep pulling harder and harder and harder, then at some point, these parts are going to come apart. Do you agree with that? Okay. So, and that would be a failure if it was to come apart. Do you agree that that, that probably the reason you have it is to not come apart, right? So if it does come apart, that's probably not a good thing, okay? So let's think through this. Assume you can have any dimension on this thing that you want, and I want you to think of the ways that this thing could fail so that it could come apart. In other words, which part of it could break that would allow the thing to come apart? And when we figure that out, let's then go in and see if we can figure out how we would determine the area that failed, the area of the plane that failed, so that we can then define how much stress was occurring on that plane of failure. Got a couple of hands here, yes. So like, the easiest would be the pin. Okay, so we have a suggestion for the pin. Were you gonna put another suggestion in? Yes, the backside of the tongue. Okay, so why don't we, um, why don't we start, he, he suggests, why don't we look at the pin, let me start there, all right? So that's, and then we'll get to one of the other ones here in just a second. Okay, and probably the most obvious reason why people think that the pin is the first one that might be good to look at is uh, there are a lot of connections that are built this way so that the pin acts like almost a, uh, you know, in electricity you have a fuse a lot of times that will uh, keep your equipment protected in case you have too much uh, current flowing in a particular system. Well, sometimes mechanical systems have something similar that if there's too much force, that uh, may develop in a system, they have a, a pin that they intentionally put in there called a shear pin, and it's the piece that breaks first before ruining a more expensive piece of equipment. That's not an uncommon way to, to have these things built. So anyway, that might be one reason why the pin looks like it's a, an obvious one to look at. Okay, so how would we figure out um, if we could have any dimension of this thing, which, di which dimension would matter to you in terms of um, you know, what we would need to know to determine stress acting on the pin. The diameter of the pin, someone says, okay? So let's go ahead and, and give ourselves that. What letter do you want to give it? D. I'm good with that. So let's say that's the diameter of the pin is D, all right? Now, how much stress can we think of acting on the pin? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do here. Let me draw a quick picture and say, if it was to come apart, what would happen would be that the tongue would slide out, okay, and I'll draw a little small version of the tongue down here, okay, and what would happen is that pin, a little chunk of that pin would stay in the hole, right, but it would break right along that plane, right? but it wouldn't break just on that plane. Where else would it break? Okay, there'd be another plane down below that we can't see, you know, because it's on the underside of this thing. There's another plane of this pin that would also break at the same time or would have to break at the same time in order for the thing to come apart. Okay, so I could draw that another way and basically show it from the side where I would show that this would be the tongue that's being pulled on with a force of F, and then there'd be little chunks of this pin that would be left over, and the, the uh, faces that would have been 
broken in order to make this thing come apart would be right there on top and then another one on the bottom. Okay, so one way of looking at this is that we would have F over 2 and F over 2. Right? Because we're going to have half and half of that. That force is going to distribute between the top and bottom of that pin. Okay? So thinking about all that, how would we define the stress that's acting on that face? Okay, first of all, it's good. Someone says it would be shear. Okay, so let's say tau, because remember tau was the letter we're going to give to shearing stress. It's going to be equal to force over area, just like all the other ones. The F that we're talking about, what do you want to use for that? There's two ways to think about it. Okay. One is to think about looking at just one of these faces. Right? If you do that, you would say the force acting on that face is going to be F over 2. And what's the area of that face given that we know the diameter? Pi D squared over 4, or someone says pi R squared. But since we defined the diameter of the pin as D, I'll just leave it as pi D squared uh, over 4. Okay, what's the other way of thinking about this? Okay, you can think of it as uh, you have a total amount of area of two times the circle, right? And you have a total amount of force of F. And so the other way you can think about this is with a total force of F over what? Two, right, or 2 pi d squared over 4, just to be obvious about where that would come from. Are these different? No. Two different ways of thinking about it, but same conclusion. Um, and so it's the same, you know, kind of the same deal. All right. So this is what I would call shearing stress in the pin. Okay, the question just now was, why are there two different equations? Okay, because we approached it from two different ways of thinking. But if you look at them carefully, the two equations are mathematically the same. We just arrived at them two different ways, so they're arranged in two different ways. Okay, now, I want to make a point here that say, to say that my point with all of this is absolutely not that you should be memorizing a bunch of equations. That is not what I'm trying to do up here. What do you think I'm trying to do? Right, I'm trying to spur you to start thinking about any type of a connection that you look at. You can probably take a look at it and figure out which planes you feel like would fail. And then once you do, you can figure out, are those planes, they look like they're parallel or perpendicular to the force that's being applied, right? So that you know whether you're talking about normal stress or shearing stress, okay? And then after that, figure out what the area values are going to be of those faces and, you know, along with the force that's applied to those faces so that you can figure out the stress that is going to be applied. So this is one example where we have done that for this connection. Okay? Now, that's good. Someone else had another idea, and, and it was someone said the backside of the tongue. Is that what you said? Okay. Let me... Uh, I don't know, there's a couple of ways I could interpret what you're saying, so let me, uh, I'll pick one, and uh, if it's not the right one, we'll do the other one later, okay? So let's think about, um, you know, if this tongue was to fail, and it failed uh, where the hole was, tell you what, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and draw this, this thing complete first. Okay, and we're talking about there being a hole right here, and there's still a force of F applied over here, which means that F must be reacting in the hole, right? In other words, the pin is putting a force in that hole, and the tongue is, is now being stretched by this force of F. The first way I would think to interpret the backside of the tongue breaking off, which was the other suggestion we had, 
is to think about there being a plane right here that would open up. Okay. Now, there is going to be normal stress in that plane, would you agree? Because that plane that I just set up right there is perpendicular to the direction of the applied force, so there's going to be normal stress on that plane. All right. Is that the only plane that is carrying normal stress? Okay. In other words, could I have put another plane here? Is there a plane right there that's also carrying normal stress? Okay. Why would I not look at that plane and instead look at the plane that I drew first? Okay. A lot of you are saying less material or less cross-sectional area. Right? There's actually less material to share the load because the hole is in the tongue. So that is, doesn't count as area that carries the force because it's missing. Right? There is no material in the tongue in that hole. So you decrease the amount of cross-sectional area there. Decreasing the amount of cross-sectional area does what to stress? You're decreasing the denominator, right? So what are you doing to the stress? Increasing the stress, which means it's more likely to fail if, if everything else is equal about the piece, right? It's more likely to fail uh, where the hole is than somewhere else. You got a question? Uh huh. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I follow exactly the scenario that you're you're talking about, but I will say this: what you have to do is you have to look at the uh, the amount of area that's still there, right? And if if there was another section that had even less cross-sectional area, then that would be more likely to fail than the one that we're looking at. Okay, so that's, you know, I figured that's where you're going with it. I didn't follow the, the specifics, but yeah, that, that would be the way it would work. Okay, all right. So remember, we have um, anything that we want to know, we, have, we can have any of the dimensions of this thing that we want. So what do we need to know now to figure out the uh, amount of stress in that plane? Okay. We again need to know the diameter of the hole, which, you know, let's, uh, I'm going to give you another term here real quick for you to think about. Um, I'm going to say that these parts are all close fitting. What do you think that means? Okay. It means that we're assuming we are really good machinists, right? And we can literally make that pin exactly the diameter of the hole, right? So that it slides right in there with no gap, right? But it still slides, all right? So we're, we're going to do it that way. So we're saying this is perfectly close fitting just to make our lives a little more simple, at least at this point, OK? So it's close fitting, which means that the diameter of that hole now is what? D, because we defined it up there as D. Okay, but someone said we need another dimension as well, like what? Okay, so the width is certainly something that, you know, when I hear someone say width, I think of this dimension right here, and let me call it W. Okay, that is something I, I would agree with. I don't know that you would need the, the, the length dimension. Right, but the thickness is one that you would, you would want, okay? So actually, what do you want to name that? T? T subscript T? Okay, he wants to name it T sub T so we know it's the thickness of the tongue. And I can respect that, you know? At the end of the day, just remember you're not here to memorize formulas. You're here to understand where we're getting this from. And that way, anything I throw at you that might be different than a clevis and pin, you'll be able to deal with those, right? Okay. But I'm okay with naming it T sub T. All right. So now we have some, some pieces of information. How do we figure out the stress on that plane that's a potential location of failure? 
find the cross-sectional area. First of all, actually, let's think about what kind of stress would this be? Normal, right? I mentioned that a few minutes ago, but yes, this is a normal stress because it's on a plane that's perpendicular to the direction of the applied force. So let me use sigma because that's a normal stress, all right? How much force? Okay, F, and now, because some of you may have a hard time visualizing this, let me actually go ahead and uh, show you what it would look like if this piece was to break off, right? It would look something like this. Right? And the area that we're talking about would be these areas right here. Okay. This is what I'm hearing proposed right now. We're going to take the thickness of the tongue, T sub T, and we are going to multiply it by the width minus the diameter of the hole. Perfect. You guys are on it. All right. It's exactly what you would do. Okay. Um, now, keep in mind, there's another way we could also think about this, right? If this is this is a, a force that's being applied in the hole, we could think of this as being F over two over here and F over two over here, right? And we could do something similar to what we just did with the pin and break that up and figure out what the area was of just one of those rectangles. But as you might suspect, it would give you the same result as what we just did. Yeah? What if that hole was off-center? If the hole is off-center, that, uh, you know, you have to make a decision uh, at that point to decide whether or not you think it's far enough off-center to make a big difference. All right, because it will make a difference, and it will make it to where there's going to be one side more likely than the other that might break. Okay, um, so let's just go ahead and put an asterisk next to that and say, uh, yes, this works really nicely if it's centered. If it's not centered, then uh, your engineering judgment has to kick in and say, is it, is it really far off? Right, and if it's too far off, then you need to be careful and say it's, it's probably not something we should model like this anymore. Okay. All right. But for now, let's keep it relatively simple. What's next? So this, let me actually, before we move on, let me give this a name. I'll call this uh, normal stress in the tongue. Okay. So I'll call that right here, normal stress. In the tongue. All right, who else has another suggestion of, of a way that this thing might break? Okay, someone says the material behind the pin could shear out in a little tiny chunk, right? I think this might be what you're talking about right here. Do you agree that there could be a couple of planes that would break right there? And if those two planes broke that I just sketched right there, then the tongue would pull out and it would, you know, leave that little chunk of material behind the pin, but the whole thing would, would come apart if those two planes were to break. Okay? So I agree. That is another way that this thing could break. And so let's actually go down here and say, what would that chunk of material look like if it was to break out? Okay? To me, it th I think it would look something like this. Right, there'd be this little chunk of material that just broke that's right behind that pin. Where are the failure planes? They're right here, right? There's one I could identify right there, but then there's another one on the, on the opposite side as well. Ah, good, good point. So he's saying if that one breaks first, right, if, in order for that one to break first, you would have to have less area than the, the other direction. 
And he's got a good way of thinking about it, but I want to add an, another point to that. The strength of a material against failing in shear is not the same as the strength of a material against failing in a normal orientation. Okay? As a matter of fact, the strength in shear is generally about half of the strength in a normal orientation. So the, the general thought is right, but you also have to add in this other factor that says if it's going to fail in shear, it has a different strength in that orientation than in the uh, normal orientation. Yeah? So his, his question is, is that based on our theory that we had earlier about how you can line up the bonds and that's why it would end up being ha about half the strength in shear? Um, it is related to that, but it's just a little more tricky than that. Okay? As a matter of fact, we're not even going to get into uh, all the reasons why that that is. Uh, a later mechanics and materials class is going to cover that material for you as to why that is that there's this relatively set ratio between shearing strength and normal strength. Yeah. His question is, is it the yield curve that determines that? And I, th I think he might be talking about a, uh, a stress-strain curve for a piece of material. We're going to talk about the stress-strain curve next time. So we'll, we'll get to that. It's, it really isn't that, though. Yeah. Is it relatively similar for most materials? Um, his question is, is it relatively similar for most materials, that ratio between shearing strength and normal strength? Um, surprisingly similar between material groups. It's not always exactly the same, but it's the same enough that uh, it's the kind of thing that if you don't have information about one of the kinds of strength, uh, you can be pretty sure if you're doing some kind of mechanical design, you, it's, it's a reasonably good assumption to make um, to, to find that ratio between the two strengths. All right, but I'm going to cut that short a little bit because that, that will be a topic for those of you who stick with it. Um, I cover that in ME 361. So hopefully you'll be around until then, those of you who are in mechanical. Your other folks, um, I'm not sure whether or not you'll get it. So, All right, so there's a little chunk of material. And again, we need to go back to we know all the dimensions of this part. We just need to identify which ones might be important, right, so that we can... Uh, we can define an equation, let's say, that will give us the stress in that little chunk of material. So what matters to us? The length from the middle of the diameter to the end of the block. Right, the length from the middle of the diameter of the tongue to the end of the block. That little length right there. What do you want to call it? L sub P. Okay. L sub P or something like that. Yeah, All right. Why don't we just call it L? Okay. So if that's L, where is L on here? It's this, right? Did we already have this dimension? That was our T sub T, right? All right. So. What kind of stress would we we'd be talking about if it was to fail in this orientation? Okay, it's shear. Why? Because the planes are parallel with the direction of the applied force, right? Because what we're talking about here is that uh, we have a force being applied this way of F, and then each of these planes is reacting to that. You could call it F over 2 or whatever on each side that are reacting to that force uh, of F that's pulling on that little chunk of material. Okay? And so what would our stress be? Shearing stress, right? What would it be in terms of our formula? Okay? We could say force over... Okay? Now, on the one plane, it's L times T sub T... But keep in mind, there's also another plane back on the other side, right? Back here, there's another plane that would also have to fail at the same time for it to come apart. So this would be 2 times L times T. Okay? So far, so good? All right. <clears throat> 
This, by the way, we often refer to this as tear out stress. Okay, so those are some good thoughts that everyone's had so far. What else? What else could fail? Okay, we have similar kinds of things on the clevis, right? Like I could define a plane right here. Right? And uh, if it failed on that plane, both on the top, you know, tongue of the thing and the bottom tongue of the thing, if it failed on both of those, then the whole thing would come apart. Okay? So let me, get, let me throw a few dimensions up here that might matter to us. Let's say this, width, this is a width of W still, like we had for the tongue. Okay? Um, what do you want to call these little guys? Okay, I figured we might have a subscript on these. T sub C. Okay, anything else matter to us? Okay, so the, uh, another suggestion is the length from the pin to the end of the clevis, and I would say that definitely would matter if we were talking about tear out uh, for the pin out of the clevis. But if we're talking about normal stress, then that's not a, a dimension that we need to know. Okay? So, let's actually look at that real quick. So we're talking about there, um, you know, two pieces of material coming apart that each look like this. Okay, and they each have a width of W, a diameter of the whole of D, and now a thickness of T sub C. And the, so let's say this is the top part of the clevis up here, and I've flipped it around to where we're seeing it from the other direction. How much force is just the top one carrying? Okay, half of the force, so F over 2. All right. And so now if we want to figure out this normal stress, we can say it's F over 2 over what? Um, T sub C parentheses W minus D. T sub C times W minus D. Okay, and I'll say, you know, if we want to give this a name, we could say this is the normal stress in the clevis. All right, now we could do the last one if we want to, right? What's the last one you think? Tear out. Tear out. Um, how would that work? Let's, let's not even spend too much time on it. Well, how would it work, though? F over 2 of the same thing to the tongue. So right. We'd have two little chunks of material, uh, each of which look like this. Right? And so you'd have to figure out the total amount of area, understanding that each of those chunks had two sides to it. All right? You guys are doing great. There is actually one other way that this thing might fail that's a little bit less obvious. Yeah? Okay. So his suggestion is it could break maybe somewhere halfway between, like halfway down the pin or somewhere else in the clevis. Those things are certainly possible, and there is a whole effect that I'm not even accounting for here, and that is uh, 
the pin uh, can do things like flex, right? So the pin, it, under the load that's being applied there, it might actually want to bend, not just shear, okay? And there's, uh, you know, that, that's a real concern that someone might have if, uh, if they kind of understand how this might work. You know, let's ignore that for the time being. We're going to get into flexure a little bit later in the course, okay? What you got? Okay. So you're you're saying it could there could be a failure plane like back here somewhere. Okay. Let me help you out a little bit. Anytime you have two parts that touch each other, right, and they're contacting each other, there is a form of stress that will develop between those parts if they're if they're loaded against one another that we will call bearing stress. And it's because they bear against one another. Right? It's always a compressive form of stress. If you've got two things that touch each other and you're trying to jam one into the other, that's called, it'll generate what's called bearing stress between those two bodies. Are there any locations in this example where there's going to be bearing stress? Okay. Yeah, the pin is bearing against the holes of the other two parts. All right, so let's look at that for the tongue. Right, so let's say, you know, I uh, I think about I'll I'll just show a top view of the tongue. All right, and there's the hole that's in that tongue, and we have the uh, the pin that's also in that hole. We're trying to drive the pin this way, and we're trying to pull the tongue that way. And so where will this stress begin to develop? Do you say basically right around here? Okay. Now, the, the actual nature of the stress between the pin and the hole gets a little complicated. All right? There are some models that I've seen used where they essentially use... Um, like with a polar coordinate system, they'll, they'll talk about this stress as a, uh, almost like a sinusoidal or cosine curve um, that basically says you're going to have the largest amount of stress uh, acting on this surface right here in the middle. And then as you move further and further out, it gets to be less and less stress. Okay? And that there's a... a like a cosine function or a sine function, depending on how you define your angles, that would define the, uh, you know, the shape of that curve. You want me to make your life a little bit easier? We'll save that for another time. Let's do this. Instead of thinking about the actual profile of this stress, let's actually do this and call it an average. Okay? So... What would the average stress be if you were to take a projection along this face? Okay, in other words, you know, it's kind of the same stress along the whole face. What do you think a good way would be to figure that out? Okay, diameter times thickness. It's like you're projecting, you, you see this cylinder, but if you look at a cylinder in 2D from the side, it just looks like a rectangle, right? And if you project that area, then that is a reasonable enough approximation of the average stress across that face just to take that projection, okay? So let me say here, I'll say average bearing stress. Okay, and how would we calculate that? 
if this is the tongue, what would that average bearing stress be between the pin and the tongue? Okay, first of all, it's a normal stress. Bearing stress is always normal, right? It's always this uh, contact between two things. So it's a normal stress. We're still talking about a force of F, right, in, in each case. Okay, so we'll talk about F over D times, what did we call this earlier, T sub T? Okay, so his point just now was, if something was going to fail in, a, in this bearing stress kind of a scheme, you know, that wouldn't be as catastrophic, right? That's, that's his point. Okay, and that's a good point, right? If it fails, what's gonna happen? Okay, well, I'll tell you, practically what tends to happen is the hole itself will often mushroom, right? It'll actually move some of that material uh, out of the way. It doesn't usually maintain the exact shape that it was before. It'll actually sort of begin to mushroom out at the location where the uh, force is being applied. Um, have you all, I mean, some of you have probably towed trailers in the past, okay? And you have a hitch on your truck, right? Uh, and a lot of you probably have the style where it's got the receiver and then you've got the, the ball mount that goes into the receiver and you put a pin through it, okay? Um, so this is an example that's very similar to that. Have you ever seen someone who has loaded one of those to a, an extent that they shouldn't have? Okay, you, have you done it? Yeah, okay, so what happens to the holes? Yeah, that someone's, you don't have the right terms for it, you don't, can't think of the term, but it looks like it's been wallowed, right? It wallered out, right? It tends to start having a shape that's no longer round, right? That's what it'll look like. So it is a failure, it's just harder to talk about it in terms of if it fails, the thing comes apart. It might not in this particular orientation. Okay, good stuff. You guys are thinking about this very well. Shall we do another example problem? Yeah, I see heads shaking. This is not a clevis and pin. This is a different kind of a connection. Some people will refer to this type of thing as a T-slot, right? So the idea here is that we have a T that's sitting in another piece that has a slot. Right? Again, it's close fitting. And let's say it's symmetric about the center line. All right? And what we want to do is find the normal stress first in the stem of the T, then the shearing stress in the flanges of the T. The little pieces that stick out to the sides are called flanges. All right? Then we'll find the contact stress, which is another word for bearing stress. We'll find that between the T and the slot. Then we'll try to figure out what the worst normal stress is in the slot. And we'll try to figure out the shearing stress in the fingers of the slot. All right, so let's do part A. Okay, normal stress in the stem of the T. How do we do that? Okay. The stem, let me, I'll, I'll put another label up here. I'm thinking of this as the stem, right? The, st the part that sticks out that direction, okay? Now the stem looks like it pretty much has a uniform cross-sectional area, at least if I had drawn it a little more cleanly than I did, right? It would have a uniform cross-sectional area to it. And so all that really takes to figure out the stress in the stem is what? Okay. So it's going to carry two kilonewtons of force divided by how much cross-sectional area? 15 millimeters. 
times what? Five millimeters. Okay. So, so now what? Like, I need to get this into some actual units of some kind, right? So, two kilonewtons. What do you, what do you want to do with the kilonewtons? Would you say there's a thousand newtons in a kilonewton? Okay, so I can apply a conversion factor like that to the numerator. What about the denominator? Okay, there are a thousand millimeters in a meter. Okay, so uh, if I want to, I can say uh, a thousand millimeters in the denominator, like this, and a meter in a numerator, like this. But is that enough? I have millimeters squared, right? So I should probably take this conversion factor and square it. All right, so let's type this in. All right, I've got two times a thousand divided by 15 times five, all right, times, let me put another fraction in there, one over a thousand, but then that will be squared. Okay. Let me show you another nice little trick here. If you would like to show this in um, a different kind of notation, like a scientific notation, this little ENG key is really helpful, right? It'll show it to you in a little bit different orientation or, or notation, I should say. Um, so what's our answer? Okay, 26.67 times 10 to the sixth units. Okay, this winds up being newtons per square meter. Do we have another word for that? Okay, newton per square meter is a pascal. All right. And 10 to the 6, do we have any uh, prefixes for that? 10 to the 6 is a million, right? And a million, we often use mega as the prefix that denotes a million, right? So what we actually say here is that what we have is 26.67 MPA. Okay, and before too long, we'll talk about whether that's a big number or a small number. Right now, you probably don't have any feel for whether or not that's large or small. Right? In other words, are there materials that can carry that or not? You know, I'll let you know. I'm not worried about it. The materials will carry that. Okay? But we'll talk about that a little bit more depth soon. All right. What about the next one? The shearing stress in the flanges of the T. Okay, so it tells us we're trying to find shearing stress, so let me just put a tau up there. The flanges of the T are the pieces that stick out, and so if I was going to identify where I would make a cut, I'd basically say for them to shear off, there would have to be a couple of planes right there. Right, and both of the flanges would have to shear off for the stem to come out. Right? And that's important because that's going to increase the amount of area that has to fail that's helping to support this, right? So, how much force? 2 kilonewtons. Okay. There's two planes, so you do 2 times. What are the dimensions of that flange? Okay, eight millimeters times 15 millimeters. Okay, 
Again, we'll apply our conversion factors like this and like this. Okay. And actually, it won't change a whole lot from the one I just entered right here, right? What changes? Okay. Let me just put in new numbers here. So let's say I already had a 15. Let me put in an 8 and a 2. How about that? Okay. What's my answer? Okay, 8.33 megapascals. Okay, earlier I shared with you that um, <coughs> shearing stresses are typically about half of uh, normal stresses in terms of the strengths, I should say. The shearing strengths are typically about half of normal strengths. So which one is more likely to fail? Is it more likely to break the stem off or is it more likely to shear the flanges off? Which one has more stress? Okay. You got 26.67 megapascals of stress in the stem. It is twice as strong in that orientation, but you're more than twice the amount of stress, and so you would expect that you would probably want to, you know, the first thing that would happen would be failure normally in the stem, not shearing of the flanges. Okay. Does that make sense? We'll get to that a little bit more. Don't worry. Um, all right, part C. Contact stress between the T and the slot. So contact stress, what kind of stress is that? It's bearing, right? There's another word we used for it, but it's, is it? It's normal, right? The planes that we're looking at are perpendicular to the direction of the applied force. Okay? So again, we're going to have two kilonewtons. What's the area that that two kilonewtons distributes across? All right. Okay. 40 millimeters minus 5 millimeters essentially gives you the sum of this wing and this wing, the width of those two wings, right? Would be f if you take the sum of those two, that would be 40 millimeters minus 5 millimeters. Okay? And what else do we need? Okay? The height would be 15. So what we find here is that we will have 15 millimeters times 40 millimeters minus five millimeters. Okay. Apply again our conversion factors. And what we will find here when we punch this stuff in will be Put in here 40 minus 5. Okay. 3.81 megapascals. All right, so a lot of you are copying that down. While you're copying, let me actually put a little asterisk on here. For this particular connection, um, it is actually important for us to remember that we're making an assumption. We're making an assumption that flexure is not a problem, right? That the, the wings of that T, we're assuming those are just going to be stiff as possible so that it perfectly distributes that force across those areas. In real life, you think that's how it would work? Yeah, the, the material's not perfectly stiff, right? So it's going to actually start flexing those T's, and as it begins to flex the wings of, those, of that T, it'll 
that would have an effect in real life on the stress distribution on those faces, right? We're not asking you to think yet to that level, but I, I do want to mention that, that that is a, a factor or an effect that, um, you know, before we go out and try to do a bunch of design, uh, just remember that that's something that will also go on. Okay? Part D, worst normal stress in the slot. Why do you think I worded it that way? Because there's a lot of places where there's normal stress in the slot, right? I could take a cross section way over here, right? And there would be normal stress in that cross section. But that's not where the worst is going to be because there are spots where it has a lot less cross sectional area that's carrying the same amount of force, okay? So where, would, where do you feel like the worst case is going to be in the slot? Okay. I think I hear some of you saying somewhere over here, you know, these little pieces could shear off. Or not shear, there'd be normal stress in those, right? So those little pieces could fail in a normal, normal stress orientation. Okay? Well, how do we figure out the, that amount of area? Okay, again, we would have two kilonewtons for the numerator. The area we can figure out by doing what? Okay, we have 70 millimeters minus 40 millimeters, right? Which gives us what? 30 millimeters. That gets split between the two sides, but do we care about that? Not really, right? Because we're going to take the entire force the entire force will distribute half and half across those two uh, areas. So we can just use the sum of those two widths, and that's totally fine. Okay, so to do that, let's put in 15 millimeters for the thickness, and then we'll take 70 millimeters minus 40 millimeters. Right? And we'll apply our factors again, 1,000 newtons per kilonewton. And 1,000 millimeters in a meter. And once we plug these in, uh, we end up with 4.44 megapascals. All right. And since that's a normal stress, you know, the number that we'd compare it against would be a normal strength, right? So, so far, our worst case, it looks like, is the stem of the T. All right, the last one we'll look at is the shearing stress in the fingers of the slot. Okay, what would that shearing area look like? Okay, I didn't really define fingers, but a lot of you can probably guess that what I mean is this little part right here. Right? If those little chunks broke off right there, would the T come out? Yes. Yeah. So that represents another spot that's a potential failure, failure location. Okay. So let's determine what the stress is in those. What kind of stress is it? Normal or shearing? Shearing, shearing because those planes are, per, are parallel with the direction of the two kilonewton force. Okay? So I'll put in here tau is equal to two kilonewtons times, you know, I'll use my conversion factor there, thousand newtons per kilonewton. And this gets divided by 
What are those lengths that we care about? Okay. Yeah, this is saying that this right here is 10 millimeters, right? So that's that length, oh, okay. and the height is 15 millimeters. So someone says 2 times 10 times 15, right? I agree with that. 2 times 10 millimeters times 15 millimeters. And again, we'd want to apply our conversion factor over here. All right. Well, let me do this. Two times ten times fifteen. So 6.67 megapascals. Okay. Let's think about one other thing real quick before we leave this problem. Do the, do the T part and the slot part have to be made out of the same material? Okay, so let's think about for those shearing numbers we just found. Um, you know, we have the shearing stress on the flanges of the T. We have a number for stress in that, and we have a number for stress uh, for the slot part of it. Do we know for sure that the T will break before the slot? Okay. <laughs> Good point, right? He says. The T could be made out of steel, and the slot could be made out of styrofoam, right? The T is going to win, even though it has more stress in it, right? It also has a heck of a lot more strength to it, okay? So these are, these are good things for you to think about. Um, if you do have two things that are the same kind of materials, that are the same material strength, well, then you can directly compare your stress numbers, and you can have a good idea as to which one will fail first. Right? But if they're not the same kind of material, you can't do that. Beautiful. All right. Any other questions before we finish up? All right. Well, have fun. I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you continue to enjoy it. I'll see you next time.